So today we will tell a story about a sad little robot who wants to get his body back. In this video I will show you my approach on how I use a component renderer and then also GraphQL in order to fetch all the data you need and render all the components in a very effective, simple and structured way. So let's tell our story. So let's spin up our project. All right, it's running. So first we will create a page. We give it a name. Robot's tail. We give it a full path. So we will be using, or I am always using a full path, not just a slug. There are some reasons for that because of the way I structure the content in a headless CMS. If you are curious about how I do it, uh, please let me know in the comments below. So now the important part is obviously the dynamic zone. So we can add some components here and we will do that and we will use three of them. So we will start with the hero section. So the hero section uh, for me just has a title and a subtitle. And then we also use a responsive image. So the way I do it is that I use for a hero, I can use multiple images depending on the different screen sizes. Uh, but for now we will just use one image and this is the one of our sad little robot because he lost his body and is basically deep down in the mud. So in this component, we can also select a color. We take white because that will fit the background image pretty well. The next one will just be a simple rich text. That's the part where we will tell our story. And lastly, because we just want to use three components, we're going to use an image text component. This basically just allows you to um, have an image on the left or right side besides some uh, texts. Nothing fancy, a headline and a text. And then we choose our image where our robot is happy again because he found his body back. And we position the media on the left side. That means the text is on the right side. And for the layout, we just have them evenly split. So text has one column and image also contains one column. And that's about it. We're going to save and we're going to publish. And our basically our backend structure is done. We have a dynamic zone that contains three components. Obviously, it could have as many components as we want, also in the order as we want it, and also there can be uh, plentiful different component types. Uh, but in this case, we just use three, um, but it will pretty much scale to as many as you want. So next, let's head into our actual Next.js code base. So just some very basics. It is how I approach uh, headless structure um, is by always using a locale. And then within that folder, you see the uh, dynamic, basically a catch all page for every slug. So what we obviously need to do in this page is we need to fetch all the data. And what we are looking into particularly in this video is how we fetch the data for this dynamic dynamic zone. So for this different components and the different the different data that we need for these components. And for that, we have a helper function, which is called get page by path. So as you can see, we have an asynchronous uh, function here uh, or react component. So this means we are using the app router of Next.js and that allows us to have um, async function calls and fetch data, remote data already in the, in the component itself, which is actually pretty neat. And then if we go down here, we get the data of our particular page. And then we just use our component renderer, which we look into later. And this component renderer gets the component map and then the components themselves. But the first thing we're going to look into is how we actually handle the data fetching. So one thing that you can see already is that we have everything typed. So for example, if you uh, would look into the page data, you see the attributes, you would see, for example, path and the title, which is the data that we actually fetch, also the components, which we can then map. So in Strapia, I'm using GraphQL because the typing in GraphQL is way better than you have it with REST, even though with newer TypeScript in Strapi, uh, which makes it very powerful in the front end. So let's first look into the data fetching part. So as you can see here, it's really not very fancy. We just use a client, a GraphQL client. Um, in particular, I'm using GraphQL requests because that's a very simple um, and small library to fetch GraphQL data and that's all we need. So using this GraphQL client, we do a request and we path in a get page document. That's basically our query 
we will have a look into how that's working just in a bit. As the variables for that query, we path a locale and then also the filter for the path. As I said, we are using the path and not the slug, which actually means that in the page, we don't just pass the slug, which is what we get from our dynamic URL from Next.js, but we make an absolute path out of that slug. So there's a little helper function, which more or less just adds the slash to the beginning. So that's why we can, where we actually expect the path and not only the, the slug. And then we just use a limit of one and not of set of zero because we will expect to just get one page back because a page should always be unique in the Stripey backend. So if we don't have any data, we should throw an error and then we just return the first result in the data array, uh, which is the page. So as you can see, the page is already typed completely and we don't do anything for that, but just auto generate the types from GraphQL. So how we are doing that is actually using the GraphQL code gen packages, which are pretty neat. And then we have a code gen function. And this code gen function basically just gets the schema from our local uh, Strapi endpoint, the GraphQL endpoint in Strapi. And then from that, it derives the uh, schemas and the types. The code gen function itself is super simple. It just uh, is a generate function from the code scan, uh, code gen CLI. And we not only create the TypeScript uh, types, but also the type document nodes and the TypeScript operations. So what that allows us to do is in our request to get this get page document. So this is generated automatically as well from a query definition that we have. Let's look into the GraphQL queries that we used. So for that, we have a GraphQL folder and then we structure it or I structure it in a way that we have for one, the generated ones. As you can see, this file actually gets pretty, pretty large. So it has all the types, but it also has the documents. For example, it has the page document. And this is actually the query that we pass to the query that we see here. So this query is, is generated automatically, but we obviously have to create the queries themselves. And those I structure in uh, fragments and queries, obviously also mutations, but we don't use them here. So the query that we have is get page. Now what's getting more interesting is how we actually use the data for the components, which is pretty nice in GraphQL. So for one, we get some data of a page itself, so this structure comes automatically from Strapi GraphQL. And then for the attributes of a page, we get the title, the path, publication date, published at, and then also the components. And then the components more or less is a union type where components can be, uh, because it is a dynamic zone, can be of very different component types. So it can be a rich text, it can be a hero, it can be an image text, and obviously it can be much more if you have more components. So the way I structure it is using fragments. So if it is a rich text, then we use the rich text fragment and the rich text fragment dictates what properties of that component I want to fetch. And then the, the same goes for hero and image text. As you can see here as well, I do structure the components within Strapi in certain um, subcategories, if you want. So elements, these are very basic, basic things like a rich text. And then content is everything content related. So for example, this hero section or image text sections. When we are working with, for example, e-commerce and we have a uh, headless e-commerce shop, then we would not only have content, but we also would have certain commerce um, components, um, for example, like a product preview list or something like that. So that's how I structure it. So then if you look, for example, in the components themselves, you would also find those, this uh, section. So components are divided into content and also elements. And then obviously you can have more subcategories as well. And then these categories, you would also see in the components themselves. So these are the GraphQL, the React components. You have content and then you have elements. And then yes, you can see everything is uh, structured exactly like you would expect. You have the hero, your hero component, you have the image text component, and everything is streamlined pretty much from the components to the Strapi 
components in the backend. And then in GraphQL, like I said, in the queries, we use fragments. And then also in the fragments, as you expect, we have content um, and elements. And there's also some Strapi related fragments. So uh, as we can see, for example, here, we have the rich text fragment. And this you would find here. This is the rich text fragment. And from that, we get back the ID, the rich text align, which uh, is mapped to the align attribute. And then also we see an HTML uh, attribute. Uh, we will have a look into the HTML one. If you look into the rich text, we have a text field, which is rich text in Markdown. So actually it's not HTML, but it's Markdown. Uh, we will have a look into how we get the HTML from the backend already uh, just in a bit. And then also you have in the content section, you have hero, and then you have the fields for the hero section, title, subtitle, title color, and then the responsive image, which again is a fragment. And this fragment you get also in the elements. And then also there is a Strapi folder, which has this Strapi basic uh, elements. So for example, here we have the image. So this is the schema more or less directly coming from Strapi itself. And then we can reuse those. So with that, we have the setup to actually get the data. So let's recap. We have our function, which is in GraphQL. We have our GraphQL client. It has a query. This query is generated automatically using CodeGen for GraphQL. And then it generates the query documents based on the GraphQL definitions. And we have queries and we separate the components, which is key for organization, into this fragments, which we have here. And everything is structured more or less the same as we have it on the backend and then also in the GraphQL layer and then also in the components. So now we know how to get the data actually. And then maybe we want to have a look and see how the data then actually looks in the app. So let's just add a, a console log in here. And let's call the page and a robot's tail. And this, as you can see, so here's our, our website with the hero section and then the text section and then also um, this image text section at the end. So if we look into the log, as we can see, there's nothing because we are using a server component, React server component. So the logs actually are on the server. And then what we can see here in the, in the page data, we see um, the ID attributes and then also the components. And then let's maybe print out the, the page data a bit uh, more properly. Oh, that's incorrect. That's what we actually get as data. So we have the components, which is an array of components. And then the type name, which we get from GraphQL, uh, is very important. We will use that for the component map later. And then we have all that data for each component. And then each component is quite different in its structure. Cool. So we do see how we get the data to our front end. Now let's have a look into the component renderer. So this is a, is a component itself. And it takes a component map and the components. And as you would expect, the component map is more or less just an object which maps the type name, as we saw from the GraphQL, uh, to an actual component. But what we can also do, and that's why I always use a component map and pass that as a parameter to our component renderer, we can also alter the uh, some things uh, from our components. So for example, here, we have a rich text and this rich text is wrapped with a container. What I tend to do is that a rich text, so each component itself should not contain any information about the layout itself. So I wouldn't want to add a container that, uh, for example, maxi like has a maximum width or anything. Also add the margins in the rich text itself, because you never know in what context the rich text will be used. But instead, I know that I, if I render it on a regular page, then I know that a rich text should always have like a margin of 24 uh, on the top and the bottom for each rich text, which is actually not working here. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, that's not that important right now. Okay, cool. So that's the component map. And then let's have a look into the component renderer. And that's a very simple function that just checks if the component exists. And if not, you could do different things. I just print out paragraph that says there's no component to render. 
So mostly that's something that you wouldn't want to see, let your users see, but as you create a page with the backend, it can be neat to have that. And then also some things, if there's no type name or no ID, you kind of know that there's something off with the query itself. And then also if there is no component existing, you get to know that there is no component implemented yet. But then if there is, you have this component from the component map based on the type name, uh, which matches the key of the component map. And then this one is rendered. And then also you would pass all the component props without the type name and the ID. And the component props are basically from all the, the attributes of the components itself. So that also means that the schema that we use in the co components or in, in Strapi, we also use those within our components. And that's pretty, pretty interesting and pretty helpful actually, because the types are all defined by GraphQL. And then you are basically just taking the types of the component and then you can use them in the React component. So for example, let's have a look to uh, something simple, the rich text. And that rich text has the properties from component elements rich text. And this has, as I said, the HTML attribute, but also the align and the text. What you also get is all those enums. So if you have enum fields in, in Strapi, you also have those as types, which can also be very nice inside the components. So everything is, is type, which is, makes it pretty, pretty nice. So now the question about the HTML field. Um, as you see in our backend, and we have a look into our rich text field, uh, we have a text property, which is markdown, but we don't have an, any HTML property. And what I like to do is not to render the HTML from the markdown in the client. I could do it in Next.js because Next.js is running server side, but actually I want to have that within my uh, content backend. And how I do that, that's also pretty nice in a GraphQL because Strapi is using Nexus um, for GraphQL, for defining the GraphQL schemas. So it's like a code first approach, which I tend to like. And then what I have in my uh, Strapi backend is a GraphQL folder. And then here I basically, I extend or I create my own GraphQL endpoints or uh, queries and mutations and types and so on. And what you can do quite easily is you can, using Nexus, extend the uh, schema definitions of GraphQL from Strapi. So what that means is, if you see we have here this component elements rich text, that's a schema, or that's a type in uh, from Strapi. Actually, that's our rich text. And then I, I extend it. So this is the keyword extend type by a string field, which is called HTML. And then you have a resolver. That's a very, a lot of GraphQL terminology. If you're not so familiar, let me know if you're interested to dive deeper into this. But essentially what that means is it tells what you, what function is being called in order to actually get the value of this HTML field. And then what I do here is I take the text from the root query, so to say, and then within the root, I have all the fields for this particular component elements, rich text, which obviously includes the text in Markdown. And then I use a converter to make HTML from that Markdown text. And then for the converter, I just use a library uh, showdown. And then as you can see, the showdown library uh, is far too large to use in a client, at least for me. So that way I have the transformation from Markdown from the Strapi editor to HTML, at least in my opinion, exactly where it has to be uh, coming from the API, uh, from our C the API that basically is in front of our CMS. So I could also do it in Next.js with the server stuff, but I tend to not uh, do it because all the concerns of the CMS, yeah, it doesn't belong there in my opinion, because that's still the back. And then in the head, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to do it. I just want to render components mostly and then obviously fetch the data. So that's how the actual HTML goes into our front end components using GraphQL in Strapi. So that's actually it. That's how we kind of have our little robot with our hero going through a wild uh, adventure. And then in the end, uh, being successful finding his body back and we made our robot very happy. So maybe we can very briefly 
have a word on the component renderer and why I tend to use a component where I pass the component map to. One thing that I already said is, which is nice, I can, uh, for example, also wrap some components if I want to. But what I also could do is I could basically just use a completely different UI component for a component of a dynamic zone that I define in the backend. So for example, what I could do is on the page, if I say, okay, so this page is a whatever, a special page. So I wouldn't pass the component map as it is, but what I could do is I could, for example, just alter the, the rich text component. And then I would just say uh, something like that. And then I would return, for example, let's just make it very easy. Um, and then I would just, oh, let's, let's make it. Oh, actually I don't fetch the, yeah, let's do that as well. So let's maybe um, put out the, the props and then the props we can also type rich text it will be. And then we could, for example, just, I don't know, maybe just print on the line, then also the HTML, I don't know. But we could do something completely different. So that can be helpful. For example, maybe you have a dynamic zone reusing some components that you have in, the, in Strapi defined, but this is happening on a left sidebar layout or maybe within a, a more complex navigation uh, and you could still then reuse that but within that component renderer you kind of alter the component map to have a different effect so if i would rerun that yeah we don't see anything because it's not uh, styled properly but then here you would see in the pre-tag actually the the html printed out so we change the the ui which i sometimes find very neat to do so that's it. The robot is happy again, which is pretty nice achievement. And if you have any feedback, please let me know because I'm just starting out. Uh, that's basically my first video on YouTube. So every feedback is appreciated. And then also if you have any question and want me to dig deeper into a certain topic that you just saw, also please let me know uh, in the comments down below. All the code will be available at some time, hopefully soon on my website. So make sure to subscribe and then you will definitely know when that happens. And then also, obviously, if you like the video and you got something out of it, please let a like there, because as I saw or learned, uh, that's super important on YouTube, obviously. Dankeschön und bis bald.